Welcome everyone to AZ Bio Peers. My name is Joan Kerber Walker. Um, today we have a fabulous program focusing on the power of strategic boards and how that affects growing biotech companies. We're thrilled to have with us our partners from NACD. Um, and to tell us a little bit about NACD, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Richard Monroe. Thank you very much, Joan, and good morning, everyone, and welcome, and thank you very much for joining us on this important program today. We really, uh, well, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Richard Munro. I'm President and CEO of the NACD, that's National Association of Corporate Directors, Pacific Southwest Chapter, which covers Arizona, Nevada, and Southern California. We're very pleased uh, to be able to bring you this important uh, program today. And we very much appreciate and value our partnership with AZ Bio, which has been developing over the last couple of years. NACD, the National Association of Corporate Directors, is the largest board membership organization uh, in the US and probably the world. It has 24,000 members and it exists to provide corporate director education and peer networking opportunities. The NACD Pacific Southwest chapter, as I said, covers Arizona, Nevada, and the Southern California, and has over 2,000 NACD members who are all experienced corporate directors. We have a very rich talent pool of experienced and qualified corporate directors in our chapter. And this program today um, is going to hopefully demonstrate that a strategic board has never been so important to emerging growth companies, to increase the odds of success and accelerate their growth, development and valuation for shareholders. We're very fortunate to have a world-class panel today with decades of experience taking startups to unicorn and beyond to public company listing status. We hope that you will reach out to us if you are thinking about developing a strategic board for your chapter. We'd be very pleased to talk to you and you can contact Joan or Dr. Jacques Sokoloff um, if you'd like to have a conversation. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Jacques Sokoloff, Chairman of SSB Solutions, member of our chapter board of directors, and he's going to introduce Dr. Eklog and take the program away. Thank you, Jacques. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Joan. We are very fortunate today to have Dr. Aklog. As Richard said, my name is Jack Sokoloff. I'm the chairman of the National Association of Corporate Directors, the Arizona Advisory Board, and also a proud member of AZ Bio. Um, it's not by accident that NACD and AZ Bio have come together to look at these key issues in governance for emerging companies. Uh, I think many people uh, think of the NACD as a bunch of uh, uh, senior directors who serve on large public companies and aren't perhaps as creative as the entrepreneurs that are creating small companies. I don't think anything could be farther from the truth. We are very much evolving into an entire new industry. And AZ Bio is a classic example where biotech, biopharma, and a variety of other smaller companies are literally breaking into much larger companies and even becoming uh, publicly traded and have a variety of different corporate structures that are very complex and governance becomes very important. Topic of our discussion today is the power of strategic boards. We'll talk about strategic boards in relationship to their fiduciary responsibilities versus advisory boards, which are more scientifically oriented. Dr. Lishan Aklok, who is a close personal friend and, and someone I have worked with for many, many years and admire greatly, has evolved through uh, the large corporate environment, has evolved from the startup to a much more mature environment with biotech, biopharma, et cetera, and, and an area very exciting to me, very exciting, I think, to you called genomic biomarkers, which we'll get into, and has successfully launched two companies from early startup to publicly traded now on the NASDAQ. So welcome, Dr. Aklog, to our AZ Bio peers. We are extremely fortunate to have you. Why don't you make a few opening remarks about your journey uh, from a physician, scientist, entrepreneur to a... Um, a Wall Street uh, CEO at this point in time. So thanks so much, Jack. It's just, it's really great to be here. I'd really like to thank AZ Bio and NACD uh, for the invitation and for the honor. Look forward to having a, um, a really um, robust conversation. This is a very important topic, uh, one that no one, when I started, 
uh, as an entrepreneur, no one gave me the primer on. I would wish I'd had some um, uh, some opportunities like this to learn a little bit about the importance and something that I've that I learned on the job. Um, um, I'd also like to point out that I have some warm ties to Arizona. I lived in Arizona for six years, so the fact that even though I'm in calling in from New York, uh, I do have a, a warm spot in my heart for for the Arizona ecosystem as it relates to to biotech and entrepreneurship in general. I know that's a very vibrant part of the community. Um, so as Jacques mentioned, I'm a I'm a former heart surgeon. I practiced uh, in academic uh, cardiac surgery at some of the major institutions, as well as St. Joseph's. Um, I was chief there at St. Joseph's in Arizona. But my whole career, I've been in interested in innovation, going all the way back to my residency. And I was fortunate to have uh, met some partners and and, and launched on an entrepreneurial um, journey. Uh, late in my career while I was still practicing. And that led to us um, creating a variety of VC-backed companies. One of them was acquired and we decided to pursue uh, a journey in um, fully in the on the business side, on the entrepreneurial side. And I gave up my surgical um, career about 10 years ago. And as Jacques mentioned, fast forward to today, uh, we've had a lot of uh, real, really exciting last decade where we've been able to launch um, two public companies, one a parent, one a subsidiary, uh, and enter into the um, uh, life sciences entrepreneurial space uh, for, you know, with, with a variety of products. It's been quite exciting. So you've had two opportunities to create different kinds of boards for two different areas of, of expertise in relationship to, to life sciences. Why don't you talk a little bit about how the experience with your first board colored your experience in thinking about selecting the second board, and then we'll get into some of the board differentiation. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll, we'll obviously get, I think, in more depth of what sort of constitutes a high functioning and high quality board. Um, I think for our early early entrepreneurs, you you just sort of stumble upon it. Yeah. So when we first, you kind of look to your left and look to your right and identify people who are you know high caliber folks who you think will be will be involved. And I think uh, in retrospect, I would have uh, been well well served to have. Um, um, you have a bit more of a prospective approach to it. Um, in our private entities, maybe I'll start, start with that before we founded PadMed, our first pri our companies. Um, uh, those were small companies that were generally single VC backed and uh, and the model was very typically the, co the founders and the funders would get together and you'd sort of have a board and it would be three people or four people uh, uh, representing the operational side and the and the funding side. And um, I would say without necessarily a lot of thought towards how each is contributing towards the overall mission of uh, what, you know, of a different type of organization, a small organization. Um, PadMed, which is, uh, we founded in 2014 and took public in 2016, was always created uh, with the idea of going public early. We had this sort of contrarian approach about how we wanted to fund our, um, uh, capitalize our, our our projects. And um, so we actually founded the PadMed board with the expectation that we would be going public soon. And the public companies have uh, um, listed public companies, NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange, have very specific requirements as to what uh, what your board needs to have. There are specific requirements around the audit committee on on certain people with certain financial expertise, accounting expertise. And so it was great. We actually um, uh, uh, looked at those qualifications and anticipated our board would be elevated and be able to function as a public company board. Um, so, so, so Lisa, you just made a yeah. very important point and I want to make sure we, we capture it. Even when you were a private company, many private companies know they're going to go public or, 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 in, or anticipate at some point in time taking on a, a more expansive financial structure. And you try to basically create a fiduciary board that would mirror what you would need to go public. Why don't you just take a couple of minutes? You mentioned an audit committee. What are some of the other things that are critical from a fiduciary board standpoint to go public? That's exactly right, because the, the the concept of a, of a fiduciary board is really is really important. And I would recommend every early stage company sort of build their boards and build their uh, corporate governance infrastructure as if they were going to go public. There are definitely best practices uh, that that are required in a public company that would be best practices in any in any uh, company that aspires to do great things. So what is a fiduciary board? A fiduciary board is a board that where each member 
uh, has a collective responsibility to all of the shareholders. And that's your fundamental um, responsibility is to protect the interests of the shareholders, not your individual interest. If you're an investor, not your individual uh, the investors in your fund, but but really uh, you have a fiduciary duty to to um, provide oversight and direction and guidance to the management team uh, so that uh, the sh the interests of the shareholders are protected. And that's not always easy. There's always you know um, not everybody is inclined to things like that. But a lot of a lot of folks uh, have to be. Uh, there are times where you have to uh, insist that uh, board members you know, put on their board hat, so to speak, mm -hmm. and put aside what other interests, you know, uh, more narrow interests they may have, particularly if they're, let's say, an investor or fund, and look at look at the uh, overall picture, provide oversight along the way. As you said, that's in co stark contrast to advisory boards. And I think many private, early stage private companies, you could ar really argue that the boards operate more like advisory boards, where you have someone who's got some finance experience who can help, you know, with capital raising, or someone has operational experience or manufacturing experience and so forth. And and they do function more like advisory boards. But I, I would say that the earlier in, in the life cycle of a company that you can establish a board that understands and explicitly discusses its fiduciary duties and operates and deliberates in a way that's consistent with that, uh, that'll ultimately serve uh, the long-term interests of the company. One of, one of the issues with biotech companies, and it's, it's, it's just personally my observation, maybe maybe right, maybe wrong, but biotech companies, and, and obviously one of the companies, Lucid Diagnostics, that you run is, is clearly a, a very, very a cutting edge genomic marker type of company. We'll get you to talk about that in a second. But the more the more complex the science, the more complex literally your advisory board certainly becomes. And then there's obviously the 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 rollover of how much scientific technology background do you need on your fiduciary board to to inform that fiduciary board in terms of the business and the science because it's it's more complex than yeah. than selling widgets, quite frankly. Right. Yeah. No, that, that's a great point, and I think that gets to one to one point of clarification, which is that even though each board member they all share the same duty uh, of oversight and the same fiduciary duty to all the shareholders, that doesn't mean they all bring the same skill set. And the, it, it is important to have a diversity of skill set, a sort of a matrix of skills within, so that each can. Uh, contribute in their own way, even though collectively they're looking out for the overall interest of the shareholders of the company. So to your point, particularly in biotech, where the where the science and the technology can get, get quite complex, it's important <clears throat> to have uh, board members that have uh, sufficient expertise to understand where management is taking the company and the assets and how it's evolving. And as you know from our board and Lucid, we're quite fortunate uh, to have to have that. We have you and we have uh, Stan Lapidus, who's the world's leading expert on molecular diagnostics, who are you know very very capable of understanding the nuances of the science. And uh, at times, um, one of the challenges can be, especially if the science and the technology is quite dense. And, and only a handful can actually sort of get into the weeds on that um, to find the right balance in the full board meetings with regard to making sure that everybody has a working understanding of where the science is heading uh, so that they can contribute their strategic input. Um, and so, uh, as you know from, from Lucid, one of the things we did is we created, under your guidance, a technology um, compliance equality committee, which separately uh, does the deeper dive with the key key personnel and management, and that's summarized uh, in terms of its strategic dimensions to the the full board, um, and that's that's worked out real well. So uh, that's that's a that's a an issue that biotech companies have to deal with because of the complexity of the science. Uh, the board has to have oversight over the science, not simply just you know the corporate operations uh, and the finances of the company. They have to know where the technology is going and how how that, um, how that the vision of, of what management is executing on is is directed to a common vision. Lee Sean, that's, that's profoundly important because I think, quite frankly, the more traditional uh, corporate director is is locked, in, locked and loaded into traditional corporate activities, whether right. it's audit, compensation, Nom, gov, all the things that large corporations kind of work on for for decades and get focused on because of the workforce and the and the size of the company and the international requirements. They're not focused on the innovation as much. Younger companies with the biotech environment have to be focused on the innovation because that's their business. Yep. You're going to live or die with your new technology. 
And at the end of the day, that board has to help you live to fight it. Has to it has to has to help you live long enough to fight the war that ultimately will make you that sustainable yeah. company going forward. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it very simplistically, the board, as we said, the fiduciary board's responsibility is to protect shareholder value. For a biotech company, the shareholder value is almost entirely entwined in, twined in the science, in right. the technology, and so the board has to have you have to have a mechanism for that to be distilled up to a level that it can be. Um, the, the 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 underlying science can actually be part of the deliberations as the board is trying to um, provide oversight and strategic direction. So, so we've talked about one innovation, and, and I have to admit I was involved in this uh, in, a, in another very large company that was trying to, at the time, market biosimilars to a world that didn't think biosimilars were uh, were worthy. Let me put it that way, and, and certainly Amgen and and Merck and a variety of others didn't think they were worthy either for almost 10 years before biosimilars actually had actually achieved FDA approval. It was that quality compliance and technology committee that ultimately proved that almost every biologic is a biosimilar. And at the end of the day, um, those, co those committees, those board committees became increasingly important in helping management kind of look at different ways to skin a cat. What other best practices do you think have been most useful to both PavMed and Lucid in relationship to uh, board contributions. Yeah, let me let me just kind of maybe a little bit restating it. Let me just reemphasize the technology sure. side of things because our own example prior to your recommendation and us implementing a separate technology compliance and quality committee, it was a real challenge for me to run. So I serve as chairman and CEO, so I have to sort of orchestrate the 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 the, mm -hmm. the agenda for the meeting in a three and a half hour four hour meeting. It was very difficult to get through all of the mechanical, you know, the finance and the budget and all the things that you would traditionally expect and provide uh, opportunity for a fulsome deliberation on the underlying science and technology and products. And by carving that out, by having what's now a 90 minute separate meeting with a, a good representation of keyboard members and having that distilled has been just transformational in terms of how, how, how we function as a board. So I, you know, I think I would emphasize that. Let me just touch on other, just other areas of, um, uh, that I think I've learned over the years in terms of best practice. And that has to do with um, providing the board with visibility to the senior leadership of the company. Um, you know, typically, normally you think of, okay, either you have a chairman and CEO, as in our case, or a separate chairman and a um, and the, um, a CEO, and that the CEO is really the primary um, conduit to the board. And that's always going to be true. And the board's um, responsibility is primarily to oversee the CEO and, and the CEO's executive role. Um, and there's, you know, we could talk about this later. There's a fine line between oversight and 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 meddling in sort of the day to day management of the company. However, for the uh, for the board, and I've learned this increasingly over the years, and I've tried to do more of this uh, for the board to really understand, uh, have a real gut level understanding and comfort with what's happening within the company and how all the pieces fit together, hearing all of that sort of condensed or distilled coming out of the mouth of one person, the CEO, is always going to be limiting. And uh, and I've um, increasingly made a point of having a strong presence of certain key C-suite people. So obviously the general counsel, the chief financial officer, the head of strategy, whatever title that 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 um, that is a, a Attributed to that, you know, those are folks who, um, and you know, potentially the chief operating officer. In our case, th that's the case. Uh, should be really active participants in board meetings. Uh, I believe, um, uh, uh, sort of at every board meeting. Now there'll be executive sessions where you, where they get excused, and you and you have um, uh, uh, conversations that can be done, and the it just with limited to the CEO and chairman. But in addition to that, as you know, Jacques, we always we try to have other members of our senior leadership team uh, make appearances and have visibility. So when I talk about the, you know, what's going on with our clinical trials, I bring Dr. Victoria Lee in on a regular basis and I just sit back and watch her sort of, you know, blow everybody away. <laughs> and and we do that in, this, in a sequential fashion. I found that 
um, to be, uh, I think, really helpful to get for the board to really understand what's happening um, uh, with the technology, with the science, with the underlying business operations. That, that's a that's a really important point. I think when you're starting a small company and you're empowering a board and then you're growing that board and then the company is growing, the individuals who are making significant contributions, usually on the technology side, but also other areas that are critical, such as regulatory compliance and, and reimbursement, as we are learning <laughs> in, yeah. in, in almost any biotech environment, because reimbursement is almost always uh, uh, a de novo kind of experience. No but the bottom line is bringing those people into the boardroom, cause them to grow professionally, cause them to appreciate what they do on a daily basis that at, at a much higher level from a governance standpoint. And at the end of the day, I think reinvigorates them towards the mission of the company. Is that is that your observation? No question. I, I didn't mention that, but you're 100 percent. It's a two way street. I think it helps the board to see them as well as, you know, when you're building a, it's not the purpose of this conversation, but when you're building a, a highly effective management team, you want, um, uh, one of the keys is to make sure that you have personnel who can not only manage down and man manage their teams and their portfolios, but can all think strategically and have an integrated view of the overall uh, strategic dimensions of the company. And nothing accomplishes that more than having them uh, present to the, to the board and hearing the the way that we talk about the issues that they will deal with every day at the board level, at the kind of the highest strategic level. So, so thanks for mentioning that. It, it is so, a two-way benefit. So our our topic today is very much strategic, but I want to do get in the want to get in the weeds a little bit because I think our our audience will will appreciate kind of walking through the stages here. So you're you're a young biotech company. You're you're you have a single VC backed or you have an angel round or a seed round and you're, you're, you're still basically in the under $10 million funding range. Most likely you have a founder, you have probably a couple other people who are close to you. Your well, your funding source, almost certainly maybe your legal resource, maybe your one or two technology resources. How do you kind of stage this? You basically, you basically get to a point in time. I, I've, I've seen it predominantly from a funding standpoint because the more sophisticated the funder, the more the funder wants a, uh, a board structure that basically supports the additional investment and sustainability of the enterprise. So why don't you just walk a little bit through how you might have started with a smaller board, then came, went to a bigger board, and, and, and how that kind of tracked over some yeah. period of time. And there's a definitely an element of art uh, to it. I'm not sure there's a, you know, we can come up with sort of a, a, a script that would fit with everybody. It has to be customized to the situation. Maybe I'll start with a, with what you want to avoid, <laughs> which okay. is that if you, uh, you know, you may start with one investor, but I've, I, we haven't ended up in this situ situation, but I've seen it before where, you know, by the time you get past, you know, maybe a pre-seed round, a seed round and in your A, it's rarely just one especially if you're going down the VC route, it's really just one investor and you end up in situations where you have um, multiple, two, maybe three, hopefully not, you know, maybe four individual investors who, uh, where, where that's, the, the board is really becomes just a vehicle for each of them to uh, express their own individual interest. And, and honestly, sometimes unabashedly, um, uh, promote their individual interests as opposed to the interests of the overall company in a, in a somewhat narrow way. And I think that's not easy to avoid. I mean, from a founder point of view, you are obviously beholden to your investors in many ways. Um, but I think, I think it's important for any founder or any early, early um, uh, CEO or, or chairman or manager person who's you know, running and building the company to, to really work hard to avoid that trap and and to do so by our, by making the case to the uh, investors or the, these folks to say, look, at the end of the day, we do have a common shared interest here, which is a well-functioning uh, company and uh, and one that can grow and create value and and benefit all of us collectively and really try to lay the groundwork, set the roles, provide formal um, governance structures to avoid um, the you know, sort of inertia, uh, inertial trap of just adding and in, adding investors and board members. And the next thing you know, uh, particularly as a founder, next thing you know, you find yourself in a situation where you have a dysfunctional board that, and you really have lost sort of overall um, control, not that you need single control, but you've kind of lost the game in that sense. And that's, 
and nothing can be worse for the long term uh, uh, ability to to create shareholder value than a dysfunctional board. And I think, as you hinted, I you know we had early in the Pavet experience, we we had uh, boards that kind of again got cobbled together as a result of who was involved in the earlier stages of, of founding the company, of helping us raise capital, and so forth. And um, you know, we found ourselves in a situation where we were not functioning um uh ideally it was uh contentious at times acrimonious um and um at times quite unpleasant for me uh and others and we sort of slowly worked our way towards uh, fixing that by um encouraging folks who were uh who are investors but otherwise uh were were not um uh contributing to sort of the, the, the proper functioning and governance of the board to step down and backfilling that with with new and fresh blood. And um, and we worked our way towards towards a much better and more functional board. But um, that's a trap. And there's and not you can't always avoid it because no, you know, no, each of the I, investors I think, have power, have, yeah. have sort of influence and power in the process. And so well, I, I think the I think the important thing for, for us to share with everyone is that the board process just like the scientific process, just like the management process, and just like the operational process, it doesn't always go in a straight line in the right direction. Yeah. It, it kind of goes up and down and sometimes a little bit sideways. And the ability to manage that governance process is another skill set that yeah. you've developed and evolved in the last 10-year period of time. Learn the hard way. <laughs> sometimes learn the hard way. Yeah, I think I think just being more proactive about it, not letting sort of things evolve in there just by by passive by passivity and sort of inertia, and and thinking at the earliest stages when it seems like your primary focus needs to be how do I advance this molecule to this point or how do I advance the technology? And yeah, there's a I have to have a board meeting every quarter, and you know I I to get that out of the way. You know, thinking about the governance side. Of, of, a, of your board at the earliest stages when it may not seem as relevant as raising capital and advancing that technology. Um, I think it's important. I would have probably done a little bit differently if I had uh, I'd had some of that some of that wisdom at the beginning. So so given all the wisdom that you have and, and all and quite frankly, all of us who have been on the long end and short end of of, of decisions that affect governance, management and operations, as you kind of look through this, and you look at saying to yourself, okay, um, the board has been important, but at the end of the day, oftentimes what is guiding the board structure so much of the time is the requirements for funding sources. So obviously when you went public, there was a significant amount of money that was raised in the public market because you, know, you were a well-established company. They liked your science. They also liked your board. There were like four or five elements that made you successful in your launch not the least of which is the capital markets are receptive at the time yeah. which is another which is another key not so much today <laughs> yeah. but why don't you reflect for a moment on the fact that at the end of the day when you look at your thresholds for funding and where you get your funding um how important do you think the board structure is and 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 how did you think about that in your process? I think once we became a public company and I, sort of as we were heading to being a public company, having a a um let's just say a high pedigree, you know, notable um, um esteemed board was very powerful. <laughs> you know, for a small public company, we, you know, between our two companies, we have a lot of serious firepower on our board in terms of people with, you know, um, I won't rattle off everybody's bio, but they're all, you know, multi, multi, ten, tens of billions of dollars, uh, companies worth tens of billions of dollars, managing tens of thousands of people with experience in all aspects of crisis management, of finance, of funding, of public and private, and and also just sort of name name recognition and, and sort of stature, right? And and that's important, you know. Uh, the, the, the in a public company, your outward appearance um, um, is important, and people's perception of 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 who you are and 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 the serious seriousness behind your endeavor is important. And having a, sort of a high high powered board that has um, strong pedigree uh, is important. Now, obviously, that can't be at the expense of how things operate behind closed doors, you also have to, you know, you shouldn't sacrifice. I mean, there, there are plenty of examples of, of, of um, I won't give one in particular, but there's, you know, there, there are examples of companies, I think in Silicon Valley, for example, that have dabbled in, in med tech, uh, where uh, the boards were just, you know, former, 
you know, Secretary of Defense, former this, you know, people who are just clearly, clearly were brought on for their name recognition as opposed to um, having a prominent person who has deep corporate experience that that can provide value as well as uh, some sheen to the company. And I think well, you're, balancing you're, you're that's touching, important. You're, you're touching on a critical area. And, and 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 there to be honest with you, we can mention the company's name. It's all public. The Theranos example yeah, always the, comes to mind, yeah. where you basically have a drop of blood that theoretically was bought off by some very high-powered uh, corporate environments, such as Walgreens. Walgreens signed a license for Theranos, which embarrassed them tremendously later on. And they had a board that consisted of a whole bunch of people yeah. who were all cabinet-level people that didn't have a clue about healthcare. But right. the bottom line is, the board didn't ask questions. The board yeah. didn't. In, in healthcare, one of the areas that you and I have spoken quite a bit about, and I know everyone on this call who is developing a healthcare product of some type, is the whole compliance and regulatory area. Yeah. You, you absolutely, you will live and die by the, the compliance and regulatory constraints that are put yeah. upon your product. And that's one of the areas your board can be very important. And, yeah. and you're, as a, from a management standpoint, You've got to know how to manage the FDA and a variety of other things you just touched upon earlier. Why don't you talk about the regulatory and compliance yeah. challenge with a new technology? Yeah, let me let me touch on that. But I think before I forget, I want to you 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 touched on a really important sort of high higher level thematic point, which is that um, and it's important both for I know you know we're we're talking most of the audience here are, are on the entrepreneur side, the management side, as opposed to prospective board members. But it's important. One of the most critical purposes of a board member is to ask the critical question, right? To say, you know, you may not have the depth of experience in some area, but I, you know, and, and it's also important, excuse me, for management to not only welcome that, but listen and actually encourage the board to be asking the critical questions, you know, and I, I can rattle off over the years, so many good examples of so many key examples of board members such as yourself um, that have asked really critical questions like wait a second are we at the right are we on the right trajectory in terms of how much we're investing in our commercial inf infrastructure have we actually gone through and 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 done the analysis and and you know on different levels of, of commercial investment at this particular stage of the company or do we have sufficient protection on cybersecurity or you know just very a variety of just 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 asking critical questions uh, and 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 forcing management to do it and so I think a really well functioning board that functions well with the with on both sides with management uh is one where manager welcomes the questions don't doesn't feel threatened by them the board members feel they're that's part that's their primary duty actually is to ask the tough questions and, and you have a good back and forth in terms of uh, drilling down on that and i think i think uh as you said just to get to your direct question that's particularly critical uh in the environment we operate in in, in, in life sciences and biotech which is a highly regulated um uh, environment appropriately so because the consequences of um of uh failing to reach up to those the standards are you know matters of life and death or or significant suffering and that's the lesson from theranos honestly which is that just since we talked about it which is that the silicon valley mentality of like run fast and break things i forget all the you know all of the all of the buzzwords that are fine if you're making an app with angry birds or you know a social media <laughs> platform but it, it doesn't work if you're if you're trying if you're building technologies where or people, if it kills people, somebody yeah where people's lives are at stake right and so and so so um, that's 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 the, the, that example I think uh, illustrates the point you're trying to make. So um, so within the regulatory side, clearly uh, we have uh, FDA uh, oversight. We have um, a whole variety of compliance issues as it relates to our our uh, FDA oversight of the actual technology to make sure that that we're operating within uh, either our um, either heading towards the appropriate path to get regulatory clearance, or if you have regulatory clearance, that you're operating under the auspices of that of that clearance and you're not deviating from that. Deviating from that could have really, really catastrophic consequences uh, to the company. Um, and then there's a whole slew of, of related compliance matters. If you're dealing with patient health information, make sure that making sure that you protect the uh, protected health information uh, um, in the in the appropriate um, in the appropriate way. There are all sorts of audits in various organizations. We run a commercial uh, central clinical laboratory that has oversight from uh, the College of American Pathologists. We get audited by the FDA, and so having an infrastructure uh, that um, 
uh, that is robust, that has a you know rigorous quality system and all of the appropriate people that's sufficiently staffed in order to do do those things is critical. And having the board, you know, be assured that all of those measures are, are being um, uh, taken into consideration and that the institutional um, the, the reputational risk and the operational risk of the company are being preserved is ultimately a very important um, uh, requirement of, you know, it's an important uh, goal of what the board should be doing. And again, going back to what we had said earlier, we talked about carving out technology onto into a separate committee. Again, under your guidance, us moving the compliance and quality side as it started to get quite, quite a bit more complex into a subcommittee of the board that can do the deeper dive and then report back at a high level to tell the full board that everything's good or we're, you know, we're addressing these particular issues with, you know, audit and audits and, and compliance and so forth has made that process much more effective and efficient. Well, I, I think the other thing that contributed to that was the realization that the infrastructure necessary to deliver that quality of accountability was very different than what, yes. what, what it was when we started. And, and quite frankly, when we're dealing with the, the type of cutting edge technology that we're dealing with, you don't have any room for error because everybody is already questioning whether it really works or not to start with. So, yep. <laughs> so, yep. so let's talk about that for a quick second. I, I don't think the audience appreciates the fact that Lucid is very focused on methylated DNA genomic markers. This is absolutely the, the I don't want to say the final frontier, but it's the cutting frontier of looking at disease at the molecular level so early that we literally are starting to participate in the understanding of what that really means to the pathophysiology of certain diseases. Why don't you talk about genomic yeah. markers for just a quick second and sure. what it's like to run a company that's kind of on the cutting edge of that kind of technology. Right. I mean, genomic is a broad term, right? And what you hinted at is methylation, which is really yep. epigenetics, right? And the reason why epigenetics is interesting, uh, we've known, you know, we've been able to track and test for and utilize in clinical practice mutational changes for, for a long time. Uh, but the, but the, what we're working on um, is really on the epigenetic uh, side where, you know, methylated uh, tags in various um, uh, parts of the DNA sequence can can happen in early stages of a, a pathologic process and can be early indicators of a of a pathology. So just a, a quick um, bullet summary of this, in our case, what we're trying to do is prevent esophageal cancer. And in order to prevent esophageal cancer, you have to pick up the precancerous case because a stage one esophageal cancer has a 50% mortality. So it's not a victory to pick up early stage cancer. And so we have to do true precancer, sorry, true cancer prevention through precancer detection. Um, at the precancer stage, you don't see me, me, substantial mutational changes. You, you, see, you don't see until the later stages things like you know, increased copy uh, numbers and things like that. What you see in the earliest precancer are subtle epigenetic changes in, in, on methylation sites. And so our the assay that we licensed from um, Case Western that's been developed over the years can pick these up at the earliest precancer stage, which is really unprecedented. Um, to pick up a early precancer before you see any dysplasia, not to sort of throw medical buzzwords around, but any sort of meaningful cellular changes and just sort of subtle cellular changes on a, on a biopsy can be picked up by picking up an epi, a subtle epi, epigenetic change at an 85% sensitivity has never happened before in medicine or science. And that's why we're excited about, 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 about this. But to run that, to run that assay in a central laboratory requires, you know, really robust, um, um, quality systems and operational excellence to be able to pick that really ultimately pick a needle in a haystack. It's just a few uh, methylation changes on a couple of genes across the genome. Well, it's uh, it's the the genomic markers not only for cancer but for many many other diseases are in their infancy in relationship to truly understanding not only how to obtain them but then how to act on them clinically. So it's it's a very exciting place to be and. And hopefully will be very expansive in terms one of the things we're learning about that i forgot to mention is Jacques, is that learning that you know that we when you compare the gold standard right the question is what's the gold standard right and normally you enter into molecular realm and the gold standard is some traditional thing right you do a biopsy you do an endoscopy you do you look at it how does it look what's mm -hmm. the color i mean all these kind of you know just gross pathological assessments of things right mm -hmm. but what we're learning is that the biologic signal at the molecular biologic level is clearly an earlier signal and and ultimately it's likely better than the gold standard and so you have to sort of work your way through to to get to to get to that point where you can prove that you're actually better than the gold standard. 
So, so this again is a good example of how from a board and a management perspective, there are certain members on that board who can provide that bridge in relationship to some of the areas Dr. Acklock just mentioned. And I guess it would, might be useful for the audience to basically understand when you talk about that bridge now, where we're trying to basically understand the, the gold standard, which has historically been like a histological kind of endpoint in terms of cellular change versus a molecular change at a methylated DNA level or any other kind of ne next generation technology that we're looking at. Um, it's, 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 also, it's using obviously the company, it's using your, your advisory board, but it's also, it's also having people who are in the establishment of, of what that old guard perspective was understanding the next step in this. Is that a fair yeah. characterization? I think so. I mean, it's again, it's just a question of sort of successfully, successively distilling it in a way that very, various folks can understand. So by having a dedicated committee that can get into the weeds mm -hmm. and our chief scientific officer leads that and, and, and brings the two or three board members who are three board members who are part of that committee really, really deeply in the weeds in it. But then it's all of our responsibilities, the members of that committee, as well as myself, to distill things in a way so that when we get to the full board level, that people who might have less experience, less expertise in it, can actually understand the underlying science sufficiently so that they can execute and dispose of their duties uh, to to provide sort of oversight. And that's just that's just a responsibility that you have to do. You have to be able to tell that story. If you can't tell that story, if you can't tell that story to your board. You're not going to be able to tell it to investors, some of whom are not, you know, or maybe generalists who don't necessarily dive into the weeds on this. You're not going to be able to, you know, present it to, um, you know, for you know, public relations purposes and all, all sorts of other, 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 um, uh, and all, all sorts of other settings. We have a question in from Dr. Johnston from Calvary, which is the question I was just going to uh, bring up. So he's he's clairvoyant, and that is, you know, we, we've spent quite a bit of time on. The fact that with some larger companies or more sophisticated companies as they become public, you create these quality compliance you know, technology committees and, and they've proven to be very powerful in, in a couple of different environments. But assume that you literally don't have, you're not that far along in your evolution and you do have a powerful advisor, a scientific advisory board, very good scientific advisory board. How do you use the scientific advisory board um, from an optimal standpoint when you really don't have that pushed up to the full board level. Yet. Yeah, I think that's an art. I think uh, one thing just to just as a quick um, uh, added note for what we've already talked about, which is that the subcommittees of the board can have guest advisors, can have um, uh, ex what he said ex officio members of that uh -huh. that can provide. Sir, and as you know, on our uh, we're fortunate on our technology compliance and quality um, committee that we have Alberto Gutierrez, who is the former head of. The IVD in vitro diagnostic branch of the FDA of the FDA, and for our previous comment, was the guy who took down Theranos. <laughs> so <laughs> when, when we're when we're at that meeting, it's and Alberto signs off and says, "Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Looks like you guys are doing the right thing." We can all kind of breathe a sigh of relief. So part of part of this is, I think, an exercise from the management, you know, CEO and senior management of taking understanding all of your advisors, right? Say, okay, who are who are we going to who is going to advise this company? Where can we get useful? advisory uh, ad advice with regard to the, all of the various aspects of things that we do, whether it might be regulatory, whether it's the underlying science and so forth, and then utilize them in the appropriate way. So including, for example, bringing people into your into sub board subcommittees to provide, to provide that, and then aggregating some subset of them into a scientific or a medical advisory board or both, right? Sometimes, mm -hmm. it's, sometimes it's useful to have, a, to have two separate advisory boards, one that's focused on the underlying science and one that's focused on the on the medical side, you know, the physicians who are actually going to be utilizing the technology. We've set up MADs. Um, we don't have a unified scientific advisory board. We just have scientific advisors, including the founders and the original um, inventors of the technology that we work with closely. Um, but once you have that, then they operate quite differently than the board. I mean, that's, I think, one of your opening, you know, thesis of this whole right. conversation is that there's a fiduciary board and there's an advisory board. I think it's a, it's a you know, the it's pretty clear what your advisory board is supposed to provide you with, which is a, you know, a broad perspective of the science, of the underlying technology, of um, a, a source of um, feedback for, you know, are you heading in the right direction? I, one of the things that I... And I caution folks who are getting into this early is to 
treat them as just that, as an advisory board, right? Um, I, I served on the other side when I was in, as, at least on the physician side on medical advisory boards, and I found they could, they either work really well or really badly. That a lot of times you end up with a you know you end up with the fanciest titles and the people who are the heads of the department, you know, who have you know various competing egos and their and their primary not to be overly cynical about, it, but they're they're you know they're they're you know they don't function in a they're not commercially minded. And uh, either they're sort of yes people or like, you know, really every every cool scientific um, um, uh, step is is really interesting or they can be naysayers and they're not sort of useful kind of down the middle, finding the right balance between, you know, the pros and cons of various approaches. So um, when you build a scientific advisor board, making sure you have sure it's helpful to have very prominent people. Uh, we're fortunate at Lucid to have the number one, you know, one of the leading esophageal specialists in the country, who's the uh, author of the of the guidelines and on esophageal precancer as the head of our MAB, and he's fantastic in all regards, Dr. Shaheen. Um, but it's good to have a mix of academic uh, folks, you know, deep scientists, but also uh, folk folks who are more. Um, clinically oriented and understand the application of the technology in a clinical setting. So you have a diverse set of views, but at the end of the day, you can't just sort of pull them and say, what does everybody think? Okay, let's do that. You know, sometimes you may get a lot of opinions and ultimately decide that, you know, that that's, that they're not sort of honing in on the right thing. So you still have a responsibility to make those decisions. And, yeah, and we have a lot of technologies represented today. So I wouldn't want us to overly focus on, on the oncologic aspect of things. But there's been so much focus on on so many different areas of early diagnosis or treatment of cancer, or a variety of things. My observation, Lishan, is that so many people uh, who are career scientists have a vested interest in a particular methodology or approach and have received significant funds, either R01 grants or variety of different kinds of, 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 of areas, and are experts on one aspect of cancer, and that may be a DNA perspective, maybe an mRNA perspective, maybe whatever. But if it doesn't fit into that model, they don't understand it as well yeah. as as they might otherwise. And sometimes some of the best technology that's coming out just doesn't look like anything they've seen. And at the end of the day, their initial response is, I've really got to learn more about this, or it just doesn't seem like it fits my model. Yeah. So, it's important so, to get their opinion. It just yep. doesn't detract from, it doesn't uh, diminish the responsibility of management to to um, uh, curate those opinions and and come up with the right answer. You know, I, I tell my technology team at times, I said, you know, well, we talked to five doctors and and they said this, when I said, well, you've talked to five doctors, you know, <laughs> all we've done is so far, we've talked to five doctors about something. And that's not, that's just not, uh, you're not going to get a definitive answer. You still have to ultimately try to understand how their opinions are generalizable to, to a broader audience, potentially with when it comes to physicians or to the, you know, the broad um, set of opinions on the scientific side. We, we've touched upon the FDA briefly. And it's, I don't want to say it's an area of quicksand, but it's an area of quicksand. And most young biotech companies, uh, I think, perhaps under, un underestimate the complexity of dealing with the FDA in general, because unless you've been through it several times, you haven't been through the FDA. And, yeah. and identifying appropriate resources and budgeting appropriately and understanding it could take not not an insignificant amount of resources to get through that FDA. And once you're through the FDA, it means you just have a license to hunt. It doesn't mean you're going to have a guaranteed revenue stream. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about the regulatory environment enabling the economic environment, which then has barriers yep. that you've encountered. So I am not a FDA basher, interestingly. You know, I have very, very, you know, harsh things to say about our reimbursement infrastructure. But I think for the most part, the FDA has actually gotten quite a bit better over the over the years um, that I've been doing this over the 10 years, 10, 15 years um, at being more transparent and more predictable. They're still somewhat rigid, you know, in terms of like the form, the formality of how you have to do a pre-sub and then you got to go back and they have a 90 day clock and a lot of that. But even on that, even on that front, they're making imp they're making um, improvements on that with breakthrough device. There's a tap, there's a program called tap. They're looking at how to how to improve the way they do digital health and things like that. So I, I, I actually. Um, uh, you know, we've had positive interactions with the FDA over the years. We've had frustrating ones where we think they were 
they were um, not appropriately categorizing us in various in various ways. Um, but overall, I, I think it's positive experience. So what that means to really the answer to your question is that the company has to have, you know, a high level of um, uh, focus, you know, understanding and expertise uh, you know, high caliber people who are looking at this and, and developing your strategy. And the strategy is should be one of getting as much insight as early as possible as to what your expectations are as to how the FDA will view this and what the trigger points will be for, for an FDA uh, review. Our chief regulatory officer, um, Deepika Lakhani, is a former FDA examiner herself. She knows kind of the psychology and the inner workings inside out. And she's just masterful at giving us very subtle, nuanced insights as to how we think uh, the FDA is going to look at various aspects. And so whether it's an in-house person who has that that level of experience or whether um, that's that's outsourced to a consultant, uh, I think that's an area that... Um, that uh, when I've talked to early stage companies that many of them skimp on where they just say, yeah, I got a regulatory person, you know, I pay a regulatory person to give me, you know, opinions about this. I, I think they, they tend to underemphasize under that. I think more, in, one of the lessons I've learned over the years is that more engagement is better uh, than less. Uh, and so having frequent multiple, we have a product right now in PadMed on the digital health side where I think we're up to like our ninth pre-submission meeting with them where we've had just kept going back and saying, okay, now what about this aspect? Or what about this preclinical testing? But what about that? And now we're at the point, we had our last one where we feel very confident that as we're wrapping up the preclinical phase of this, that we we have you know a high level of confidence as to what the FDA is going to say when we make our when we make our actual submission. Um that, that's so a pearl. That's a pearl right there. The fact that you've been there with your experience, the fact you've been you've done a Q sub or precept Nine times, yeah. nine times for different or, things, not the same yeah. topic, but like different little elements of what uh, of the uh, process, you know, and um, yeah, and that's actually contrary to the early advice we got a deck over a decade ago, yes. which was more, yes. which is more along the lines of ask for forgiveness, not for you know, and not permission, where you just sort of like just put it all together, submit it, and then try to work it out during the uh, during the review process, uh, because if you you know there was a little bit of a psychology of be careful what you wish for that if you have the precept once they say something in precept you're kind of stuck down a path right and so there are two competing philosophies and my and but I've definitely uh, flipped over to the the more um, ultimately the more engagement you have early on the better your like your outcome is going to be yeah if there's one thing to take away from this conversation that's it yeah. because to be honest with you it was the opposite yeah. probably five six seven years ago yep. you threw a lot at the wall and you saw what sticked yep. and then you went you went with what was sticking on the you wall you tried to fix whatever you tried to fix whatever they kind of spot yeah, exactly back. exactly <laughs> Joan, I, I, i'm getting joan would you like to, to jump in here So thank you so much. This has been a fascinating conversation and I, I truly appreciate both of you, you know, sharing the insights and, you know, both the good, the bad, and, and sometimes the ugly relative to boards. For many of our smaller companies, um, you know, they hear from me quite often. You have to have a fiduciary board. You have to have people who can not only advise you, but, you know, in certain circumstances, take you out if you are not doing the appropriate things. Um, Theranos, which you know was an example where the board, because of her shareholder position, couldn't take her out. And that yeah. was part of the problem. So the, the, when I say that, the thing that the small companies say is, okay, that's great, but how do I get high quality board members? Um, how, how can I reach out to these people? What's the best way to get the best people for your scientific advisory board or the best person for your fiduciary board. How do you start that conversation? Good question. I think I'm just, as you were saying that, I was just trying to think back on our own experience. <laughs> and it was a combination of um, me just being somewhat audacious and reaching out to people in my network, you know, high, high caliber physicians who've had experience in industry and so forth. But then um, also over time, uh, bringing in board members that, that I didn't have any prior um, um, engage, you know, knowledge of, or I wasn't an acquaint I wasn't acquainted with, um, and we actually used a, um, a search firm uh, once we were a public company. Uh, we found that there were, uh, you know, there's a there's a whole cadre of 
uh, highly accomplished, generally, you know, senior executives, CEOs of companies that as they're wrapping up their careers and they're moving on, they go on, they uh, they don't really retire. They just go on boards. Right. And and so uh, there is there are resources out there. There are there are search firms that will do that. Um, otherwise, just picking up the phone and calling, calling, you know, trying to if you identify somebody uh, indirectly or through other contacts indirectly, like we, like Stan Lapidus, who I mentioned earlier, who's the vice chairman of Lucid, the lead independent director, um, and just an incredible, incredible, incredible asset for us, given his history and experience in this space. Um, that was the one of the the scientific co-founder of Lucid had worked with him 15, 20 years earlier, knew of him, and just kind of said. Hey, I wonder if Stan Lapidus would be willing to join your board. This is the kind of science that he's really interested in. And, and you look at him and he's got he's on, I think, eight boards. And I found out later he gets asked to be on like 50, he's been asked to be on like 50 boards. And I just picked up the phone with the introduction from them and, and asked him. And he, you know, it took a while. He it was about a year. He served as a strategic advisor for a year and watched where we were going with the company before finally agreeing to come on the board. Um, so I think there are no, there's no script to it. I think it's mostly just being audacious and throwing out a wide net and trying to find folks within your network or that are one or two degrees of freedom removed from you to, to find, to find the, the people, but they're out there. They're definitely out there, you know, uh, people who are nearing retirement who want to serve on boards. So another question, um, I had the opportunity to get to know Tom Grogan, who was the founder of Ventana and then later, you know. Um, sold his company to Roche. Um, one of the things that he talked about was the importance of the physician scientist and the um, role that they play in truly understanding, you know, what the need is for the patient at the clinical level. Um, but it also can be a real challenge for a physician scientist to make the leap into the C-suite and now have to deal with a lot of other considerations that they don't teach you in medical school. You've made that leap. How did your board help you with that? I just, yeah, so that's a great point that that there is physician, scientist, and you have to be a physician, scientist, executive, right? So phys the physician, scientist side, that, that kind of duality is fairly common. There are physicians who are interested in the science and focus on that. But I think there's a certain aptitude for it. I found that there's some physicians who simply can never kind of get their head around the commercial side of things. And there are those who have the aptitude who just need guidance from board members or other mentors to, uh, and are open and willing to embrace the commercial side of things, right? And so, um, so you have to have the aptitude. I think I think me and my co-founders have. I take pride in our company has five physician uh, executives on the executive leadership team. Uh, we have one, two, I think three board members who are are, are physicians, um, and all of them obviously have have that aptitude and have embraced the the um, um, opportunity to uh, learn about the commercial side and the strategic side. Um, and and you just have to be able to leverage the the resources you have around you to learn the learn the finances, learn how to read a spreadsheet, how to read a balance sheet, learn you know how to you know, what are the me methods methodologies out there for raising capital and so forth, and and a willingness to roll up your sleeves and do that. So Jack, um, you know some of the people on this call would like to be board members now or in the future. Mm -hmm. Um. How do resources within ACA, NACD or um, building relationships with other people who are board members, how does it help those leaders on their journey so that they can be contributing members of boards in the future? Well, probably one of the biggest advantages in terms of looking at board opportunities is to be around individuals who are like-minded, which means if you're around people who are on boards, if you're educating yourself in the certification process of being a uh, more professional or advanced board member, and or you are staying up on all the different issues that Dr. Acklog has talked about. He's talked about fiduciary issues. He's talked about scientific competency issues. He's talked about regulatory issues. We talked about compliance. We talked about even being creative and creating new board committees that facilitate the next generation of, of science in companies like this. So being, I've always found the best way 
to basically be asked to be on boards is to have all the foundational prerequisites, then have special areas of expertise and be around organizations and people that are looking for board members. That's why at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of a confluence of events that allow you to basically blossom professionally yourself as an individual director and become more and more competent in relationship to complex board opportunities. Can I make one real quick comment? I know we're tight on time of that, but I would encourage uh, everybody, even th those who already have their own company and, and are, are running it, and that's their full time job, to serve on other boards. I've had I've had the privilege of doing so on a couple of occasions, and it's been indispensable because I can obviously I bring value and I bring the th my experiences, but what I learned from that, and my CFO has the same thing. We it's like, wow, well, you know, w w one of the things that we did in you know one of our board our board companies is X. I mean, Jacques has heard that in yeah. our board meetings where we say, you know, one of our board companies did this. And and we'll all come together and, and share that experience. So it's actually you don't want to do too much of it because it can be time consuming. But uh, one or two additional boards is actually I, I find it very valuable. That's an that's an excellent point. And for publicly traded public directors, I think it's a maximum of two additional boards. Yeah. But yes, that's correct. And so here here comes in, and I knew this question was coming. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm a small company. I have limited cash. I need a fiduciary board. They expect to get paid. How do I compensate them? Well, I'll, I'll ask that quickly, and then Lisa can certainly amplify. Having been someone who served on very large company boards, been paid large amounts of money, and sometimes those companies have done well, sometimes those companies have not done well, that's the old model of expectation that you're going to get paid as a director. And that's cash, and that's short-term, and that's long-term stock appreciation, et cetera. I'm grossly oversimplifying this. I'm just giving it to you at the very high level. Then there are companies that, as a director, myself, and I'm speaking for me now, are so interesting and so transformational that you'll, you want to be there at the, front, at the front row of what's happening. And for those types of companies, you will negotiate an equity type of payment that may or may not be worth anything but it's worth being on the site of perhaps the next generation of change in genomic markers or mRNA vaccines or something, or AI, for instance, that is so transformational that you're, you're not there for the money. You're there for the education and your experience and guidance. But yeah, I think for an company. early stage company who's just raising capital, if you're your board, you can't pay your board members any meaningful amount of cash. That's just right. not... They should be uh, folks who are inspired by the the story, who are looking on the upside, and generous equity um, uh, compensation should be sufficient for for at that early stage. As a That's public great. company, generally you do pay a modest amount, but it's not as much as most people think for a small stage company. Most of that is still in the and and that's actually fairly the, the amounts are fairly standard across small companies in terms of what their their metrics of what you should pay. Um, uh, presumably, you're you're well capitalized at that point, and it still it still is primarily an um, a um, an equity um, compensation. So that's that's what I would recommend. Thank you. So we are coming up on the end of our hour, and um, I want to give um, first of all a huge thank you to both of you for sharing your insights with us today. Um, Dr. Aklog, any closing comments? No, oh, I would just, uh, this has been great. I really appreciate, again, the invite, Jack. Obviously, you're, 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 you're a master at, at getting the uh, uh, all of the key points across. Hopefully, that, that was useful. Um, I guess I'll just end by saying, you know, it's thinking about at the earliest stages about your about a fiduciary board and uh, sort of taking some of the lessons that, that we described here, many of which I learned by making those mistakes at the beginning, uh, uh, I, I would encourage everybody to really pay close attention to that and to uh, really nurture a a um, you know a a prominent and value you know value added board, and it'll have you know, it can have a big impact ultimately on the success the success or failure of your of your company. Thank you, and Jack, any closing thoughts? You no, know, I just want to thank Dr. Acklog. I want to thank you, Joan and Richard, and all obviously our audience. I think this is a topic that continues to be on the top of mind of many, many early stage companies. And to be honest, I wish I would have had these opportunities earlier in my career as well. So I didn't have OJT the way that, that Dr. Akalak and I have had many times. Thank yeah. you. Well, thank you both. Thank you to all of our um, 
AZ Bio members and guests that joined us today. And if you missed some of this program, it will be up on video on the AZ Bio Peers page later this week. Um, thank you. Join us next month for another edition of AZ Bio Peers. Bye, everybody.